Presente. Dois. Here. Diaz. Presente. Drum. Eugene. Present. Gibson. Good afternoon, I'm present. Jonai. Present. Rodenchik. Here. Holden. Here. Kalos. Here. King. Present. Ku. Present. Good afternoon. Kozlowitz. Here. Lanceman. Here. Lander. Here. Levin. Here. Levine. Here. Lewis. Present. Mizell. Here. Menchaca. Presente. Miller. Moya. Present. Perkins. Powers. As in. Reynoso. I know, I said present. I know, but the mic's going to turn off. I, I got you, Councilman Perkins. Thank you. Reynoso. Richards. Present. Rivera. Rodriguez. Rose. Present. Rosenthal. Here. Salamanca. Present. Torres. Present. Traeger. Here. <clears throat> Ulrich. Balone. Van Bramer. Here. Jaeger. Here. Matteo. Here. Combo. Present. Speaker Johnson. I'm here. Madam Majority Leader, we have a quorum. Thank you so much. We will now have today's invocation, which will be delivered by Monsignor James J. Kelly, spiritual leader at St. Bridges Church, which is located at 409 Linden Street in Brooklyn. Good afternoon. My name is Father Kelly and St. Bridges is located in Bushwick, but we also serve Ridgewood. So we were supposed to have an, I was supposed to do an invocation for St. Patrick's Day, but it has been postponed. And so it is my privilege and my honor to lead you in prayer this afternoon because we are in the midst of a pandemic, as you know. We used to call it a plague, or you can use the word pestilence. This is not something new. From biblical times, the human race has been the victim of epidemics, viruses, and pandemics. Now, Ireland, where I come from, was not spared and is currently suffering from COVID-19. In 1649, Cromwell came to Ireland while Italy was recovering from the plague of 1630, described dramatically in Manzoni's famous novel, The Betrothed, in Italian, I Promessi Sposi. So this afternoon, I want to lead you in prayer for the grace of healing and protection. Lord Jesus Christ, you traveled through towns and villages, curing every disease and illness. At your command, the sick were made well. 
come to our aid now in the midst of the global spread of the coronavirus that we may experience your healing love. Heal those who are sick with the virus. May they regain their health and strength. Heal us from our fear, which prevents neighbors from helping one another. Heal us from our pride, which can make us claim invulnerability to a disease that knows no borders. Good Lord, healer of all, stay by our side in this time of uncertainty and sorrow. May those who have died from the virus rest in peace and rise in glory. Be with the families of those who are sick or have died as they worry and grieve, defend them from illness and despair. Be with the doctors, nurses, researchers, and medical professionals who seek to heal and help those affected and to put themselves at risk in the process. May they know your protection and peace. Be with the leaders of all nations, be with the leaders of this council and the members of this council. Give them all the foresight to act with prudence and charity for the well-being of the people they are meant to serve. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for that very timely prayer. I know it touched the hearts and souls of all in this body. Mm -hmm. We will now like to have the Invocation to be spread on the record by Council Member Danny Drum. Danny, I think you're on mute. Yeah, I'm coming off. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And I'd like to spread the invocation upon the record. Uh, and in so, in so doing, I'd like to thank Monsignor James J. Kelly uh, from the District 3 Immigration Center. Monsignor Kelly was born in Adair County in Limerick, in Adair County, Limerick in Ireland. Monsignor James J. Kelly was ordained to the priesthood in Rome in 1960. On May 8th, he will celebrate his 60th anniversary as a priest. Arriving in Brooklyn, Father Kelly was assigned to St. Bridget Church in the Ridgewood area. During his studies in Rome, he learned to speak Italian. To minister to new immigrants arriving in the community, he learned the Sicilian dialect. Eventually, he learned Spanish in order to meet the needs of the newest arrivals. In 1974, he established New Life Child Development Center. Father Kelly studied law, graduating from St. John's University in 1980. Since his mandatory retirement in 2016, he opened the District 3 Immigration Center, located near the church. The office is open six days each week. His very capable staff assist clients in filling out necessary forms to petition for family members and ultimately assist in attaining citizenship. In addition, Father Kelly oversees ESL and citizenship classes, which help clients on the road to permanent citizenship. Besides all of this, Father Kelly usually celebrates daily mass. On Saturdays and Sundays, he celebrates multiple masses often in neighboring churches. I'm very proud to have him here with us today. I'm sorry that we missed you on St. Patrick's Day, but we know your dedication to the immigration, to the immigrant community in New York City, and we are very glad to have you here again with us today. And with that, I'd like to spread the invocation upon the record. Go Redmond slash Red Storm. Thank you, Council Member Drum and council member Cornegie. Uh, and thank you so much, Monsignor <laughs> Kelly, uh, for your beautiful prayer. At this time, we will now have the adoption of minutes and we are asking for council member Cohen uh, to offer the adoption of minutes. And nobody told me I was doing that, but I'm happy to move to adopt the minutes of, I'm not sure what the last day today was. Council Member Cohen, it would be June 25th, 2020. I move that we adopt uh, the minutes of the June 20, I'm sorry, 25th? Correct. June 25th, 2020 meeting. Thank you so much for that. And we will now move on to messages and papers from the mayor. M246, City Debt and Reserves. Received, ordered, printed, and filed. 
M247 HIV AIDS Services Administration Advisory Board appointment. Received, ordered, printed, and filed. Communication from city, county, and borough offices. M248, Declaration of Capital Financing Need. Received, ordered, printed, and filed. Petitions and communications. None. Land use call-ups. None. We will now have communication from Speaker Corey Johnson. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader. Good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to see uh, so many um, losing uh, technical difficulties. It is so happy. I'm so happy to see so many uh, of uh, my colleagues. I hope everyone is safe and that your families are safe and that everyone uh, is doing well and having a nice uh, summer. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us for this week's and this month's virtual stated meeting. Our city has successfully moved through phases one, two, and three of reopening and it is up to us to make sure we have a successful phase four. I am proud of the work that we have done collectively to flatten the curve and to get to this point. This is something that a lot of people could not have imagined us making it through, but we did. Uh, but the curve will not remain flat if we don't continue to do our part. I wanna remind everyone that wearing a mask saves lives. Everyone should wear a mask. Social distancing saves lives. We have the power to save lives and to protect each other. So let's continue to do that, uh, not just as a council, but let's continue to do that as New Yorkers who are looking out for one another. As of yesterday, our city has lost 23,500 of our fellow New Yorkers to COVID-19. I wanna repeat that. We have lost 23,500 New Yorkers to COVID-19 and that number includes probable deaths. And as always, we must remember that these aren't just numbers, but actual New Yorkers who were loved who had families and friends and colleagues, and they will be forever missed. To those who have lost a loved one to this devastating disease, you are in this council's thoughts and prayers, and to those who are battling this virus, we are with you. As we do during every stated, I wanna uh, take a moment to acknowledge those that have died from 9-11 related illnesses since our last meeting. The FDNY lost uh, an EMS member, uh, Desir Jimenez, and the NYPD lost Sergeant Emmanuel Alongi, who succumbed to his illness on June 27th. And the NYPD also lost Lieutenant John C. Zonnefeld, who succumbed to his illness on July 10th. We also acknowledge New Yorkers who died while on the job. I'm sad to say that Mario Salas, a construction worker, died on July 16th, working to restore a building facade in Manhattan. He was 59 years old. Our hearts are with his family and his loved ones. I also want to acknowledge a senseless tragedy that took place in our city. Far, far too many people die of gun violence in the five boroughs. So many that uh, we would be here for too long if we tried to name all of them. But I do want to acknowledge today the death of a one-year-old. Devel Gardner was shot and killed while in his stroller at a cookout on July 12th. Just yesterday Devel was Devel's funeral. And this has already been a very difficult summer and the entire city is deeply shaken by this horrible, horrible uh, murder. My heart goes out to his family during this unimaginably painful time for them. Before we take a moment of silence, I also want to acknowledge that we lost some legendary figures in the civil rights movement. They were giants in America and around the world. The late Congressman John Lewis of Georgia and Reverend C.T. Vivian, 
both men made the fight against hatred and injustice their life's work. That fight has not ended with them. Their legacy will live on. And today the council will be voting on a resolution to honor this legacy. Our hearts are in mourning and with the families of Congressman Lewis and Reverend Vivian, we know that they are resting in power. And just quickly on a personal note, when I was 18 years old and I was traveling across the country um, speaking about my own coming out experience, I was asked to come to Atlanta uh, to speak at an event down there. I had never been there before. And on my first night there, I was invited to a fundraiser for uh, Congressman John Lewis. I was 18 years old and I was in awe. And I remember it like it was yesterday. I still have a photo of me with him at that event. And he has touched more lives than he would never know. And he really did bend the arc of justice uh, in our country and across the world. So I wanna have a moment of silence for everyone who we have lost. Thank you. This Thursday, our, our fellow Jewish New Yorkers will commemorate the holiday of Tisha B'Av. This is a somber holiday that memorializes the destruction of the temples and reflects on the atrocities committed against Jewish people throughout history. During this dark time of rising hate crimes and anti-Semitism, we wish our fellow Jewish New Yorkers an easy and meaningful holiday and we recommit to the important work of fighting anti-Semitism and anti-Jewish hatred everywhere. Many of our fellow Muslim New Yorkers will be celebrating Eid al-Adha on Thursday. And I wanna uh, say Eid Mubarak. I wanna wish all of our Muslim families across the world, but especially here in New York City, a safe and blessed observance. July marks Disability Pride Month, and this month we marked the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, and we celebrate the progress that we've made in achieving equal opportunity for those with disabilities. This month is a reminder that there is still a tremendous amount of work to do for people with disabilities, and we must be committed to furthering that progress. And last, but certainly uh, not least, I I uh, just want to thank everyone for their hard work uh, over these last many weeks with so much going on in our city. Now let's dive into today's agenda. The council will be voting on three governmental operations related bills aimed at ensuring that New Yorkers have easy access to city laws and mayoral directives. Introduction number 1879A, sponsored by Councilmember Keith Powers, would provide that whenever the mayor designates a particular office or agency to administer or enforce any provision of the charter or administrative code, the mayor must publish such designation on the city's website and notify the council within 10 days. Next is introduction number 1872A, sponsored by council member Fernando Cabrera, the chair of our government operations committee, which would require the corporation council to make unconsolidated local laws enacted after July, January 1st, 1985 that remain in effect, available online in searchable machine readable format. In addition, this bill would require the Corporation Council to annotate sections of the New York City Charter and Administrative Code, which are currently published online pursuant to existing law with any unconsolidated provisions of local law enacted since 1985 that amended those sections. The next bill is introduction number 1091A, sponsored by Councilor Peter Koo, which would require the Corporation Council to make available on a single page of the city's website, a searchable and machine readable compilation of all mayoral executive orders issued from 1974 to present. I wanna thank the staff who worked on this C.J. Murray, Emily Forgione, and Elizabeth Kronk. Next, the council will be voting on uh, a governmental operations related resolution. 
This is a resolution that calls upon Congress to vote on a much delayed bill. Uh, the core component of democracy is the right to vote. Yet this right has not been equally provided to Americans as we know. Black Americans were denied the right to vote for generations in this country. And even after beginning to gain the right to vote through the 15th amendment, have continued to face drastic voter suppression that still goes on today across much of America. The passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was a huge legislative win for all Americans, but especially black Americans. Yet it has continued to face attack after attack. And in June of 2013, when the US Supreme Court invalidated important portions of the Voting Rights Act in Shelby County versus Holder, we know that that needs to be remedied. Today, the council is voting on a resolution sponsored by Majority Leader Lori Cumbo that would call upon Congress to pass and the president to sign the Voting Rights Advancement Act of 2019, now known as the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. It was renamed last week in the US Senate. This act would revive and modernize portions of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that was struck down in the Supreme Court decision I mentioned, Shelby, versus, Shelby County versus Holder. I wanna thank the staff who worked in this resolution, uh, Emily Forgione, Elizabeth Cronk, and C.J. Murray. Next, the council will be voting on a housing and buildings related bill. Introduction number 1783, sponsored by Councilor Mark Levine, would exempt affordable housing cooperatives from requirements of the housing portal. And I wanna thank Audrey San for her work on that bill. The council will be voting on a piece of legislation out of our technology committee sponsored by council member Karen Kozlowitz. Introduction number 1154A would require the encryption of exchanges or transfers of web content from websites maintained by or on behalf of the city, such as through the adoption of the HTTPS protocol. Certain websites maintained by the city that accept sensitive user information do not currently utilize secure encryption, which leaves users vulnerable to hacking or stolen data. And I wanna thank from the staff, Irene Bohofsky and Charles Kim for their work on that bill. We know that the pandemic has devastated our city's cultural arts sector. It, it, it hurts to see Broadway dark and to hear about how beloved institutions are struggling to reopen in a sustainable way. New York is not New York without the arts. We must ensure that cultural organizations thrive and have the guidance they need to reopen stronger than ever. Introduction number 1967A, sponsored by Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, would require the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs to publish information for arts and cultural institutions affected by COVID-19 on its website related to what will be relevant to the reopening plans. This includes, but is not limited to, federal, state, city, and union requirements and guidelines related to COVID-19, guidance on where to direct questions about guidelines, and resources known to the department related to financial support. It's an important bill, and I want to thank Brenda McKinney for her work on it. The council will also be voting on three health-related items today. The first, resolution number 637A, is sponsored by Councilmember Matthew Eugene, it would call on the United States Department of Health and Human Services and the New York State Department of Health to create a special commission to address health emergencies and infectious diseases. And I wanna thank from the staff, Emily Balkin for her work on that resolution. With rising temperatures due to global warming, it is critical for the city to accurately track heat related deaths and to create a comprehensive cooling plan. This plan must describe how the city will inform residents on the dangers of heat exposure, provide access to cooling, and how vulnerable populations can stay cool during heat emergencies. Heat waves and high heat can have a deadly impact on our city, and we must, and it must be treated with the same care we treat other weather-related emergencies like storms. We need a comprehensive plan that is updated annually the council will be voting on two bills that address some of these concerns. Introduction number 1960A, sponsored by Councilman Rafael Salamanca, would require the Office of Emergency Management in consultation with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene 
and the Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability to prepare and submit an annual plan beginning by May 15th, 2021, describing how the city would inform residents on the dangers of heat exposure, access to cooling, including cooling centers, and how vulnerable populations can stay cool during heat-related emergencies. The plan would also include measures for large office buildings to reduce stress on the electric grid during the summer months and be updated annually. The next bill, introduction number 1945A, sponsored by Councilmember Justin Brannon, would require the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to annually report on neighborhood heat vulnerability and the number of heat related deaths. Information reported would include, but is not limited to, the number of heat stress deaths, the estimation of heat exacerbated deaths, and a description of social and environmental factors used to determine heat vulnerability and aggregate demographic information of heat stress deaths. And I want to thank from the staff, Sarah Liss, who worked on both of these bills. And finally, now more than ever, it is important that we protect workers in New York and support them in any way we can. The next bill expands on the scope of the Department of Consumer Affairs and renames the agency to clarify that it will protect workers and consumers. Introduction number 1609A, sponsored by Councilman Richie Torres, would change the name of the Department of Consumer Affairs to the, to the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, thereby officially expanding the department's mandate. The bill consolidates the Office of Labor Standards and the Division of Paid Care as offices within the new department. It would be the new Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. Uh, and the bill also clarifies the department's powers to seek restitution on behalf of consumers and workers related to any law within its jurisdiction. The Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings would be designated as the tribunal in which the department may begin proceedings to recover civil penalties and grants, and this bill grants the commissioner the power to adopt, reverse, modify, or remand an oaths trial division decision for additional proceedings. Finally, the bill repeals several outdated or obsolete entities, including the Consumers Council, which no longer exists, and the TOE Advisory Board. I want to thank from the staff, Balkis Mirik, for her work on this important bill. And I want to turn it back to you, Madam Majority Leader, uh, so we can continue on with the meeting. I want to thank everyone again for their hard work, and I look forward to proceeding with today's votes. You there, Lori? Madam Majority Leader? Mr. Speaker? Yeah, did we lose Lori? We, we may have. Uh, we can move next to discussion of general yeah, orders. So uh, we will now move into discussion of general orders. We will recognize council members who wish to speak by using the raised hand function in Zoom. Please wait before your remarks for our Sergeant of Arms to announce uh, they have begun the countdown clock. The Sergeant of Arms will alert you when your time has expired. Uh, um, our parliamentarian who has signed up thus far to speak. We have council members Kozlowitz, Ku and Jaeger. Okay, we'll start with uh, Council Member Kozlowitz and then we will call on Council Members Ku and Jaeger. Thank Your you. Time will start now. Thank you. At a time when we are online more than ever, it has never been more important to protect New Yorkers' digital information. We cannot prevent bad actors from engaging in cyber attacks, but we can mitigate the risks that cyber attacks have on New Yorkers and New York City agency. Intro 1154 does just that by requiring that all websites that are maintained by the City of New York are encrypted and therefore less vulnerable to hackers. I urge a yes vote on this bill. Thank you, Councilmember Kozlowitz. And next, we're going to go to Councilmember Peter Koo. Your time starts now. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today, we are voting on my legislation, Intro 1091A, which will require the city to create a searchable and machine readable 
combination of all mayoral executive orders from 1974 to present. This bill will also require that the combination of executive orders indicate if they have been amended or superseded by later uh, executive orders. This bill builds off of many of the other governmental transparency bills this council has introduced in recent years that require city documents to be posted online in a searchable machine readable format. The goal of these efforts are to increase the availability and accessibility to the city's local laws, rules, and executive orders. The ability for the public to search executive orders should be no different than what is currently available in the New York City Council's website, where the public can view a bill as it moves through the legislative process, amendments and all. Currently, the public has access to our city council documents on the council website. Executive orders are enormously important to government governmental operations as they show what unilateral decisions are made by the mayor's office. These directives are key to understanding the policies and the politics of our great city and by compiling this information into searchable machine readable formats online, it will increase transparency and promote Time. the best practices of good government. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Majority Leader. Thank you, Council Member Koo. Uh, Council, uh, Majority Leader Cumbo is back. Majority Leader Cumbo, uh, I believe that next is Council Member Yeager, then Council Member Joni, and then I believe you are up to speak. So if you, want to recognize, if you want to recognize Council Member Yeager. You're muted, uh, Majority Leader. Thank you, I had a little bit of computer difficulty. Uh, Council Member Yeager, followed by Council Member Joni. The time starts now. Thank you, uh, thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, very briefly, um, at a time that we speak of, of violence in New York City, I just wanna take a few seconds uh, to remember my friend and a friend of so many of uh, the members of his body, our predecessor, uh, Councilman James E. Davis, uh, who served until this murder in the chambers five days ago, uh, 17 years ago. Um, uh, he was, uh, like I said, a friend of mine. He was, I know, a friend of many uh, members of the council uh, who are now here today, his successors, uh, and I hope we are doing him proud. He was a corrections officer. He was a police officer. Uh, he was an elected member of the city council, a legislator. Um, he was fun. He was funny. He was smart. He was wise. He loved people and he worked his entire life to bring people together. Uh, the diverse parts of the community that he represented, um, which I think uh, 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 in the history of that neighborhood uh, had a very sore need at the time of his service. Um, he is somebody who is missed by his family every single day um, and by his community, I'm sure. Uh, but, but those of us who knew him, uh, who weren't represented by him, who just got to know him, from just being in Brooklyn. Uh, he was somebody whose voice was always uh, loved. And uh, we, we have uh, the, the members room uh, at the city hall uh, named for him. Um, and I just wanted to offer that up today, Mr. Speaker, uh, with your permission. And I'm very grateful, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Yeager. And I'm glad that uh, you of course brought up uh, a former council member who you I think very eloquently described uh, who he was and his career. And if, as you mentioned, the members lounge at City Hall, which we haven't been in for uh, many months is named in his honor. And he was taken by a uh, senseless and horrifying act of gun violence in the city council chambers. Um, and I, I, it's always important to uh, recognize uh, him and the service he gave to New York City, not just as a council member, as you said, but as a police officer and a corrections officer. So I'm glad that you brought that up today. Thank you, Councilmember Yeager. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, we'll now have Council Member Joni. Time starts now. 
Thank you, Majority Leader and Speaker. I'm proud to share details about a bill I introduced, which is co-primed alongside my colleagues, my dear friend, Majority Leader Combo, and members Richards, Lewis, Ku, Moya, Carnegie. This bill will fight for more equitable distribution of SBS emergency grants and loans from borough to borough, proportionate to the small business needs of each. Much of our city's small businesses situated in the outer boroughs are already disproportionately challenged by COVID-19 and the economic recession. Nonetheless, the combined loans of all of the outer boroughs are less than those dispersed solely to Manhattan. The Bronx, for instance, received 1% of the loans and 3% of the grants in the first wave of SBS's grants and loans. Queens received 9% in loans and 16 grants. Comparing, Matt received 66% of the total loans and 53% in grants. This lack of parity is wholly unacceptable and is something that we must continue to address legislatively. I look forward to bringing continued attention to this matter and passing real solutions, which will, pre which will prevent the tale of two boroughs. I look forward to having more of my colleagues sponsor this bill and help deliver justice for all of our small businesses and all of our boroughs. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Jonah. You are always a strong champion for our small businesses, and we thank you for your service. At this time, I would like to speak about my intro, intro 1967A. I want to first begin by thanking Speaker Corey Johnson um, and Council Member Van Bramer for their incredible leadership. I also want to thank Brenda McKenney from our leg legislative division, who is not only a talented, hardworking attorney with the council, but an inspiration to all working mothers who have had to adjust to their new working environment and co-workers amidst the global pandemic. The cultural sector in New York City is one of the largest industries in this city, which employs approximately 400,000 workers, pays over $30 billion in wages per year, and generates more than $110 billion in economic activity. It does not stop there. The industry is a driving force for our city's tourism, restaurant, and hotel industries. Our cultural institutions are not merely local attractions. They bring millions of patrons from continents across the globe. It is critical that we recognize their importance as we plan for the future. When they suffer, our entire economy suffers as a result. There is no New York City without the cultural economy. When cultural institutions closed their doors in March 2020, the city's artists, actors, musicians, stagehands, and freelancers suddenly found themselves unemployed and severed from their communities and livelihoods. They have lost billions of dollars in revenue and it is possible that some may never recover, but it is up for, to us to guide them down the road to recovery in order to restore their livelihoods. However, as we begin to reopen our cultural institutions to visitors, we must approach the new normal with both cautious optimism and a commitment, a firm commitment to proper planning, preparedness, and effective safety measures to prevent the resurgence of COVID-19 in our city. Our cultural community has a huge role to play in the reopening of New York City and jumpstarting our economy once again. We have to make sure that we do so safely and we have to make sure that every precaution is made to protect everyday New Yorkers and all who visit our city for the incredible cultural opportunities and attractions that make New York City what it is today. I wanna to again thank Speaker Corey Johnson, Jason Goldman, my legislative director, Jason Herr, as well as my communications director, Alicia Mercedes, and my chief of staff, Tasha Young, who's celebrating her birthday today, and everyone on my team that helped to make this possible. This is the type of legislation that will help us move the city forward. Thank you. Madam Majority Leader, there are no other members who wish to speak at this time. Thank you so much, Lance. I appreciate your support in bringing this forward. And then we will now move into the report of special Madam committee. Madam Majority Leader, Councilmember Cornegie wishes to speak. Councilmember Cornegie, is this about one of the bills we're voting on today? No, that was my mistake. I'd like to speak in general discussion, please. 
Great, we will add you to the list. Thanks, Council Member Carnegie. Thank you. Thank you so much. We will now move into the report of special committees. None. Reports of standing committees. Report of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing, intro 1609A, Department of Consumer Affairs. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations, intro 1967A, COVID-19 Reopening Plans. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Governmental Operations, intro 1091A, Machine Readable Executive Orders. Amended and coupled on general orders. Intro 1872A, Unconsolidated Local Laws. Amended and coupled on general orders. Intro 1879A, Designation of Administering Offices. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Health, intros 1945A and 1960A, Heat Vulnerability Reporting and Comprehensive Cooling Plans. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Housing and Buildings, intro 1783, Housing Portal. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Technology, intro 1154A, encrypting website exchanges. Amended and coupled on general orders. And at this time, I would ask that the clerk please take a roll call vote on all of the items coupled on today's general order calendar. Again, we're voting on all the items on today's general order calendar that we just listed. Adams. I vote aye on all. Amprey Samuel. I vote aye on all. Ayala. Aye on all. Aaron. I vote aye on all. Morelli. I vote aye on all. Thank you. Brennan. Uh, permission to quickly explain my vote? Permission granted. Time starts now. Uh, I just want to thank Brad Reed, Sarah Liss, and everyone who worked so hard on uh, 1945A and all the um, environmental justice activ uh, activists who have been fighting so long and so hard uh, to get this done. Um, and with that, I vote aye on all. Thank you. Cabrera. Aye on all. Chen. I vote aye on all. Owen. Aye. Constantinidis. Carnegie. Deutsch. Uh, permission to explain my votes. Permission granted. Time starts Thank now. you. Thank you, Majority Leader. So I just want to take a moment uh, to mourn the losses of dozens of New Yorkers uh, to gun violence in the last several weeks and months. Uh, it is clear that there is a serious problem in our city with shootings, and I join many of my colleagues in great concern. At our budget vote a month ago, I talked about the rise in violent crime and how I believe that this was the wrong time to defund the NYPD. I want to reemphasize uh, the, the point today that it is not acceptable or appropriate for this council to bury, to bury our heads in the sand and pretend that we bear no responsibility for fixing this problem. This council passed reform bills and a budget that I believe is contributing to the rise in violence and homicides in our city. You may not agree with my assessment, but your constituents deserve your attention to this serious issue. We passed a bill in June that included a section restricting police officers from taking any physical action that would, that would constrict the diaphragm of a suspect during an arrest. This would include a cop placing a knee on a suspect's back, even just for a few seconds as they cuff them. I ask you, how can we expect law enforcement to effectively, effectively do their job and reduce the gun violence in our city if they have to be concerned that they will face criminal prosecution for arresting a resisting suspect? I do not question the, the integrity of or the intent of the bill, which is to prevent another instance, what happened to George Floyd or Eric Garner. But it is incumbent upon us all lawmakers to acknowledge the real world, world effects of our actions and to rectify them when necessary. I urge the Speaker and my colleagues to consider passing an amendment to this legislation that will remove the questionable portion of the text. 
And I want to thank you all, and may God bless the souls of all our city fellow New Yorkers who were taken from, from us too soon. And I just want to finally say that my daughter just had a baby last night, and mm. I've seen the joy of watching a newborn come into this world, and at the same time watching people being killed by gun violence. And it needs to stop, and I can't take this anymore, watching every night and visiting families of, who have been victims, their families have been victims of, domestic, of, of these gun violence. We need to take action. We need to take action today. We need to have a plan. We need to have a plan yesterday. So I'm asking once again, my colleagues, I'm asking the speaker that today I will be voting on, on some of the bills that are presented today, but, but I'm urging the speaker and our body that the next stated meeting, we need to come up with an amendment to a diaphragm bill, and we need to come out with laws that will prevent this gun violence throughout the city. With that, I vote no on 1609 and 1967 and I and the rest. Thank yes. you. Carnegie. Councilmember Carnegie. Diaz. I, 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 I vote aye. Thank you, council member. Diaz. Si and those. Yes or no? Drum. Yes. Eugene. I vote yes at all. Gibson. I vote aye on all. Don't I? Permission to explain my vote? Permission granted. Time starts now. Thank you, Majority Leader. First off, I want to congratulate Grandpa Deutsch. I hope that the baby is more like the grandmother, not the grandfather. <laughs> uh, in addition, although I'm voting yes on 1967, I do want to point out that I'm concerned with the reporting requirements and the burden it will place on our arts and cultural institutions in particular, the small NGOs, as well as the DCLA misinterpretation or potential overreach that could come about this bill that is positive and well-intended. Uh, with that, I vote all an I except for 1609. Thank you. Bro Denchik. Uh, I vote aye on all. Uh, I want to wish a mazel tov to uh, our colleague, Councilman Deutsch, on the birth of his grandchild. And I'm also happy to report that the Queens County Farm Museum, which you can see over my head or over my shoulder, will be reopening this Sunday. So any of you uh, who have young children, or maybe not so young children, or just need a breath of fresh air, please come out to Eastern Queens um, and enjoy. With that, I vote aye on all. Holden. Aye on all. Kalos. Congratulations to Chaim Deutsch and his family. I vote aye on all. King. Congratulations to Kalos. I mean, Kalos to Chaim and to your entire family, and I vote aye on all. Cool. Uh, before I vote, I want to thank the speaker, Brad Ray. C.J. Mary, Elizabeth Kwan, Emily Fortuon, Jeff Baker, and Laura Popper for helping me to draft this uh, bill. And I will eye on all. Koslowitz. I I know all. Lanceman. I. Lander. Request permission to explain my vote. Time starts now. Uh, I'll be voting aye on all, and I'm especially enthusiastic about intro 1609. I want to give real props to Councilmember Torres for leading the way here. Uh, I'm so thrilled that we're officially renaming DCA from the Department of Consumer Affairs to the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection and expanding its authority to do its job. Over the past few years, in partnership with this council, 
Uh, DCA has become one of the nation's premier worker protection agencies. Our paid safe and sick leave law, our fair work week law, our pioneering freelance isn't free law have all made it already the Department of Consumer and Worker Protections. And it's great we're recognizing it and empowering them. But let's be clear, uh, we've got a responsibility right now during this pandemic this city council can now empower this wonderful new Department of Consumer and Worker Protection to protect workers who are vulnerable right now. If we pass just cause laws, then the new Department of Consumer and Worker Protection can protect essential workers and fast food workers from unfair firing so they can speak up about PPE, about violations of their other rights so they won't be filed on a whim. If we pass the law requiring that gig workers get paid sick leave, then those uh, restaurant delivery workers and nail salon workers, the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection can make sure they have paid sick leave. Um, and if we pass reasonable accommodation laws, then parents who aren't gonna be able to go to work for days when their kids are at home doing remote learning could demand reasonable accommodations from their employers. It is great to pass 1609, but now let's move forward as a council to enable the new New York City Department of Consumer and Worker Protections to truly protect workers in this pandemic. Thank you, my colleagues, for voting for this legislation. Let's carry it forward to meet the moment. Thank you, and I vote aye on all. Levin. I vote aye on all. Levine. Yes, permission to briefly explain my vote, Madam Majority Leader. Please go ahead, Council Member Levine. Time starts now. Thank you. I first want to congratulate the sponsors of three important pieces of legislation coming out of the Health Committee today. Council members Brandon, Salamanca, and Eugene. And I also want to say a word about intro 1783, which I'm pleased we're voting on. This does something really important for HDFCs, which are, of course, low equity, excuse me, limited equity co-ops, which have provided thousands of low-income and working class families in New York City a path to achieving the dream of home ownership. But they face possible threat from a bill never intended to apply to them. Local Law 64, which would require of major developers that they post listings for new affordable apartments on HPD's Housing Connect site. This shouldn't apply to individual shareholders in HDFCs. And I'm very happy that the bill we're voting on today will clarify that in the law. I wanna thank the incredible movement of HDFC shareholders from around the city who have pushed for this. And I wanna thank the staff who worked so hard including Audrey Sun, who did incredible work over months. Um, my own, Amy Slattery. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, for pushing this. Thanks to Chair Cornegie for expediting this through the council. Um, I wanna thank everyone for your support today. And I, of course, will be voting aye on all. Thank you. Lewis. I vote aye on all. Mizell. Yes. Menchaca. I know. Miller. Eid Mubarak. I vote aye. Moya. I vote aye. Perkins. I don't know. Powers. And all. Reynoso. I vote aye on all. Richards. Aye on all. Rivera. Aye. Rodriguez. Council member Rodriguez. Rose. I on all. Rosenthal. Wishing my Muslim friends uh, an Eid Mubarak and um, voting I on all. Salamanca. I on all. Flores. Council member Torres. 
Council Member Torres, would you kindly repeat that? Council Member Torres, I did not record your role. Richie, are you there? Uh, Mr. Clerk, why don't we come back to Councilman Torres at the end of the roll call? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Traeger. Aye. Ulrich. I vote aye on all. Below. Aye on all. Van Bramer. Aye on all. Jaeger. Aye on all with the exception of introduction 1609 and 1967. Matteo. Aye on all. Combo. Congratulations to council member Deutsch and I vote aye on all. Circling back to council member Torres. I vote aye on all. Speaker Johnson. I vote aye on all. We are just tallying the votes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Madam Majority Leader, all items on today's general order calendar are adopted by a vote of 47 in the affirmative zero in the negative and zero abstentions, with the exception of intro 1609A, which was adopted by a vote of 44 in the affirmative, three negative and zero abstentions, and intro 1967A, which was, was adopted by a vote of 45 in the affirmative, two negative and zero abstentions. Thank you. The items on today's general orders calendar are now adopted. We will now have introduction and reading of bills. All bills have been referred to committees as indicated on today's agenda. Thank you. We will now move into the discussion of resolutions. As a reminder, please wait until the Sergeant at Arms begins the countdown clock before you begin your remarks. In addition, if you wish to vote against or abstain from either of today's resolutions, please email the Legislative Documents Unit. Madam Majority Leader, we have two council members signed up for discussion of resolutions. Council members Eugene and yourself. Okay. We'll begin uh, with gentlemen first. We'll have council member Eugene begin. Your time starts now. Sorry, Madam uh, Majority Leader, but ladies first. No, no, I, I insist. Please, I, I insist, insist and I defer to you. No, I insist because I also have to close it out for the vote. All so right, uh, now, okay, that's okay. That's another oh story. my God. Thank you very much. Time for uh, Member Cornegie. Yes, let, see, Council Member Eugene. Thank you so very much. Let me first uh, take the opportunity to, to thank Speaker Corey Johnson for his leadership and also his wonderful staff, uh, Jason, uh, Jeff Baker, and all of those who work hard to make this uh, vote possible for my uh, legislation. Let me say that uh, we are seeing uh, right now in the United States and uh, all over the world, a uh, horrific tragedy that affects all area of our life. And it is not a financial uh, crisis, it is not an educational crisis, but our schools are closed, our churches are closed, businesses are closed, and so many people suffer and so many people lost their lives. But the most uh, tragic uh, situation is because we were not ready for this type of pandemic. If we remember SARS uh, 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 epidemic, on 2002 and immersed in 2012 and many others. But regardless of, you know, of everything, we are still not ready to handle health emergency. The resolution 637A acts on the, acts the, state, state, uh, the, the state of New York 
and also the federal government to create a permanent uh, commission to continue to study the, the, the effect of the virus like COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 and to continue to study the physiopathology, the immunology, the biology of those type of disease that destroy so many people and also that attack our structures as a society. We have uh, dedicated skilled doctors, nurses, and researchers. We want to bring them all together to create a permanent uh, commission to continue to study and also to create plan Time. In order for the city, for the state and the federal government for our, our country to be ready to save lives and to preserve our life and also to create a better uh, environment for our dedicated health workers and first responders who put everything in line to save lives. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you also to all the wonderful staff who work on this uh, legislation. And I'm asking all my colleagues to vote yes on this legislation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Council Member Eugene. I will begin with pre-considered resolution number 1371. Yesterday, the House of Representatives voted unanimously to rename the Voting Rights Advancement Act the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Act. At the young age of 20 years old, John Lewis founded the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Throughout the 1960s, the SNCC conducted voter registration efforts and demonstrations throughout the South. In 1963, John Lewis, the youngest of the big six, who planned, marched, and spoke on the mar March on Washington, a monumentous display of civic activism that gathered more than 200,000 Americans, all supporting civil rights protections for all, regardless of race and, race and ethnicity. SNCC continued to combat segregationist voting policies by continuing to register black voters well before and after the march. In 1971, Representative Lewis stood before the United States House of Representatives in and of itself a feat of accomplishment no forefathers could even dream of and explained to its dominantly white membership that racism was far from over. He explained how there are fewer violent tactics, but the subtle and more sophisticated forms of intimidation that are still being devised and are quite prevalent. Immediately following Shelby County v. Holder, Lawmakers in Texas, Georgia, Virginia, and North Carolina rolled out voter ID laws and studies have shown that led black and brown Americans to be excluded from our nation's most democratic form of expression, the vote. This is not only occurring in Southern states who are notorious for their segregationist policies, this is happening right here in New York City. We saw it during the June primary when many voters never received their absentee ballots and were forced to stand in long lines only to face broken machines, incorrect ballots, closed polling stations, and more. Last year on the 54th anniversary of Bloody Sunday, we saw what it took for our ancestors to be at this moment, for us to raise our voices and to make sure that every single one of us has the right to equality and justice and the right to vote. It is up to us to ensure that the right to vote is protected as it is the strongest nonviolent tool that we have in the fight for equality and justice. We must carry on the legacy of our civ esteemed civil rights icons through more than rhetoric and symbolic gesture. We thank Congressmember Lewis for his incredible work. We thank him for laying the foundation for so many of us of color to even have the dream and the reality to be able to even run for office. And it is now our time to pick up the baton and to continue to do the work that John Lewis and so many others have done before us. I thank you and I thank Speaker Corey Johnson. I thank Jason Goldman and all of those that came together to make today possible. Madam Majority Leader, thank you for that. Before we vote on the resolutions, I wanna ask for unanimous consent uh, to allow Councilmember Rodriguez to vote on uh, all the items on today's general order calendar. Any objections to that? Uh, seeing none, Mr. Clerk, if you could please call on Councilman Rodriguez to record his votes 
on the general order calendar. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Council Member Rodriguez. Aye. And Mr. Clerk, if you could reread the, uh, the tally on the votes with Council Member Rodriguez's votes. Certainly. All items on today's general order calendar are adopted by a vote of 49 in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and zero abstentions, with the exception of intro 1609A, which was adopted by a vote of 45 in the affirmative. Check that. 40... Right. 46 in the affirmative, three negative, and zero abstentions. And intro 1967A, which was adopted by a vote in four, of 46 in the affirmative, three negative. Mr. Clerk. Yes, sir. On 1967, 47, Thank correct? Thank you, Mr. Parliamentarian. 47 in the affirmative and two in the negative and zero abstentions. Great. Madam Majority Leader, if you want to read the resolution so that we can begin the process of voting on them. Thank you. I'll now read today's resolutions into the record. Resolution 637 call A calls upon the United States Department of Health and Human Services and the New York State Department of Health to create a special commission to address health emergencies and infectious diseases. We will have a voice vote on resolution 637A. Will all those in favor please say aye. 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 Which would revise and modernize portions of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, struck down in the Supreme Court decision Shelby County v. Holder. Will all those in favor say aye? Aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Any abstentions? The ayes have it. We will now have general discussion. As a reminder, please wait until the Sergeant at Arms begins the countdown clock before you begin your remarks. I'll now wait to find out which members have asked to speak. And Majority Leader, the first three members who have asked to speak are Council Members Lewis, Gibson, and Barron. Okay, we will begin with Council Member Lewis. Time starts now. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Majority Leader Cumbo and Speaker Johnson, for the opportunity to briefly discuss two critical pieces of legislation that I'm introducing today. The first, Intro 2005, a local law that requires the Department of Health and Mental Health to report to the mental health of New Yorkers during the COVID 19 public health crisis. This will aim to provide us with the crucial information about the adverse effects that COVID-19 has had on mental health of our constituents in New York City. The widespread loss of life, social isolation due to stay at home orders, economic anxiety, essential worker burnout and uncertainty sur surrounding the virus itself has created an, an environment which is incredibly detrimental to the mental health of our constituents of all ages. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown us that none of us are immune to the debilitating effects of mental illness. Even the most well person can feel isolated, hopeless, and alone. I am introducing this bill because last month I lost a childhood friend, Marquise Anindo, to these very circumstances. As we come to terms with our new normal, we also are seeing how his tragic situation is not unique. He took his life because his mental health needs were not met. In intro 2005, it will help in identifying, tracking, and logging these needs and pave the way for further relief. We know how we will be dealing with the trauma of COVID-19 for many years to come, and we must ensure that we consider the mental and psychological needs of New Yorkers as well as their physical needs. In the second, 
legislation I have is Resol 1374. It calls upon the New York City Department of Education to establish a remote learning training program for parents at the height of the pandemic. Time. It's Sorry, can I finish? Yes, please, thank you. Please bring your remarks to a close. Of course. At the height of the pandemic, it took weeks for districts like mine to receive iPads and internet access to resume their academic studies through remote learning. In addition, parents were not provided with any standard training to guide their children through the remote learning process. These issues were particularly compounded for parents who were not technologically illiterate, who spoke whose English was a second language or may have disabilities and must help children with disabilities. While we work diligently to flatten the curve of COVID-19 in New York City, we have to have a strategic plan to reopen schools in fall 2020, especially with the, with the new mixed schedule and remote learning process. As we grapple with the reality that distance learning has now become our new norm, we must be prepared to provide parents and students with the necessary training and information that they would need to see children continue to strive. I urge my colleagues to join me to sign these key pieces of legislation and thank you, Majority Leader, for the opportunity to speak about these two pieces of legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Lewis, uh, Councilmember Gibson, followed by Councilmember Barron. I'm thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader, and good afternoon, Speaker, all of my colleagues and all New Yorkers who are watching today's proceedings. I'm thankful for the opportunity to be a part of this body, and certainly I want to send love and light and continue to pray for the family of our former colleague, the Honorable James E. Davis, and certainly want to lift up the family and friends and colleagues of uh, Representative John R. Lewis, uh, his labor of, of love, his life, his legacy, his blood, sweat, and tears for his entire life will never be forgotten. And I pray that all of us elected officials, no matter what districts we represent, will continue to live out all of the same principles and values that John Lewis fundamentally stood for. Um, I think when you see so many of our pioneers and trailblazers lose their lives, um, it's a reminder that the work must continue, that they have done their work for their time and their season, and now it's left up to all of us. Uh, the past several weeks have been very challenging for many of us. We have been faced with a hot summer, with a pandemic, as we reopen the city of New York and we try to get back to whatever normalcy means. But many of us have been faced with the ever, ever uh, challenge of gun violence. And that has been no stranger to the district I represent in the Bronx. And I wanna lift up the family of 17 year old young King, Brandon Hendricks Ellison, who was killed on June 29th. A few days after he graduated from high school, he was college bound, he loved basketball, he loved his friends. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And his life was taken at the young age of 17. His mom lived in our district and I continue to talk to her every single day. And she is now dedicating her life to working to address gun violence so that no other mother has to receive that fateful phone call. We all know that fateful phone call that too many mothers and fathers receive time and time again. And since that time, we've seen far too many other shootings. I uh, also wanna lift up the family of Anthony Robinson, a 29 year old father uh, who was crossing the street with his seven year old daughter in my district of the Bronx. Time. And he also lost his life. Um, and it's just a sad reminder of our work. And as I close, I just wanna thank all of the clergy elected officials, faith-based leaders, the crisis management system, all of the anti-gun violence organizations that are on the ground the law enforcement NYPD that has been helping us on the ground as we launched Operation SOS, Save Our Sons and Sisters, which is a community-driven collaborative effort to focus on addressing gun violence, the root causes, and offering young people and young adults jobs and programs so that we can take them off of the block and get them into critical programs so they can have a successful future. Everyone deserves to be safe in this city, uh, seniors, children, families, our families, and we are certainly pained by all of the violence we've seen. So I look forward to a lot of work ahead. Uh, the challenges are enormous, but I am a firm believer in faith and my principles, and I remain optimistic that only together will we eradicate gun violence and keep our city straight. So keep our city safe. So I thank you, Madam Majority Leader, and thank you, Speaker, uh, and look forward to our continued work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilmember Gibson, and I'm sorry for the losses that you've experienced in your district and beyond. Uh, Councilmember Barron. Time starts now.
Council Member Barron, you're on mute. I, thank I, you. I, can you hear me now? We, yes, we yeah. can hear you now, Inez. Okay, thank you. I forgot to unmute. Thank you so much, Madam Majority Leader. And I want to greet all my colleagues. Good really, and glad to know that we're using this forum to continue to conduct the business that we've been called to do. Uh, we've made mention of the great icons who have passed, and we've talked about Representative John Lewis, and we've also mentioned uh, C.T. Vivian, and I just wanted to enter into the record some of the comments about C.T. Vivian. Dr. C.T. Vivian, who died on the same day as John Lewis, was a civil rights leader and organizer. He was an author and he was a minister. Uh, he was a colleague of John Lewis as well as Martin Luther King. And Martin Luther King referred to him as the greatest preacher to ever live. He was born in Missouri, grew up in Illinois and studied in Tennessee where he adopted a nonviolent strategy. He was one of the founders of the Nashville Christian Leadership Conference. Uh, he organized the first citizens and civil rights marches in Tennessee. He traveled across the country speaking at churches, organizations, colleges, and also addressed the United Nations. And he is one of the figures highlighted in Eyes on the Prize. In 2008, Morris Brown University was in very severe financial difficulties and the city of Atlanta turned off the water to the college campus. And Dr. C.T. Vivian spearheaded fundraising move that in two and a half months was able to raise over $500 million and save this historical Black college. He was also the recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, and he is the author of the book Black Power and American Myth. American Myth. I think it's American Myth. Uh, so that was my comments about Dr. C.T. Vivian. And I also want to say that Time. I join with those who condemn, I join with those who condemn Representative Yoho, who made such insulting, derogatory, and sexist comments to Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And I think that uh, we need to make mention of that and condemn all of those kinds of sexist remarks, particularly as she is a woman of color also. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Barron. Parliamentarian, who are the next three speakers? Yes, Madam Majority Leader, and I'm going to read the rest of the list so that all council members know that they're acknowledged and will be called on eventually. Uh, the order of the list is Council Members Rose, Cornegie, Adams, Moya, and Rodriguez. Thank you. Um, this month, we more Time the starts now. Thank you. We mourn the loss this month of two civil rights icons, icon John Lewis and Reverend C.T. Vivian. Um, their courage and blood paved the way for expanding voting rights and um, equal rights across this country. Um, John Lewis was the son of sharecroppers and he risked his life to challenge segregation from a young age, demonstrating a courage that would come to define his life. He was beaten by mobs and arrested by police even before the infamous Bloody Sunday. When Alabama troops advanced to the Edmund Pettus Bridge with clubs, bull whips, and tear, tear gas, they fractured John Lewis's skull, but he and others still marched for voting rights. When I speak to young people today about the sacredness of the right to vote and remind them that blood was shed for this right, John Lewis is in the forefront of my mind. Without his courage, Without his willingness to risk his life, there's no telling when and whether the Voting Rights Act would have become law. It is for this and countless other achievements that Representative Lewis was known as the conscience of the U.S. Congress during his 17 terms representing his Atlanta district. On March 1st of this year, Congressman Lewis gave us a prophetic command that we should get in good trouble necessary trouble and redeem the soul of America. Millions across the country have tried to live that out in recent months, marching in every city to proclaim that Black Lives Matter. When we march, we remember the courageous example set by Mr. Lewis, and we remember that sometimes real change only comes from the grassroots. Congressman Lewis lived his truth and fought for our civil rights. We left, he left a rich legacy, a moral obligation to 
continue the fight for social justice. I think it's very fitting that we um, are calling on Congress to pass and, and the president to sign the Voting Rights Advancement Act. Of 2019. His leadership and wisdom will be sorely missed. Rest in power, Congressman John Robert Lewis. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Rose. And we'll now have Council Member Cornegie. Time starts now. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader. Um, I, I, I have a solemn feeling today. Yesterday was the funeral of young Devel Garner Jr. Um, and I had the opportunity to speak at his funeral. It is probably the worst um, uh, thing that's happened to me since I've, since I've been in elected office. I had never actually seen up close and personal a uh, uh, baby's casket. And um, I haven't been the same since seeing that. I've been challenged though that the depraved individuals who pulled the trigger and took the life through census gun violence are the only ones responsible. Uh, I believe that although there are depraved individuals pulling the trigger in our communities, society has uh, loaded the bullets into those guns by underemployment, undereducation, lack of access to good quality food, uh, in some instances, lack of uh, quality housing, disinvestment in our community. So this is not uh, uh, a pandemic that we're unfamiliar with. We have these cycles of violence in our community and they continue to come back over and over again because we've never addressed what I believe is violence as a public health issue. I believe it's important that we couch it in that way so that we can get all of the resources and can stop putting a Band-Aid or stop using NYPD as the sole source of tamping down gun violence. We know that in the 20s, when poverty was deemed a public health issue, all of the resources, including settlement houses, were designed so that we could attack poverty from all angles and eradicate it. I think the same uh, mentality has to take place as it relates to gun violence. Um, and lastly, I would say we can't continue to bury our future. Thank you. I'm so sorry for your loss and that you had to attend what should have never happened. Thank you for your courage. Thank you for your leadership and thank you for being there. Council member Rodriguez. Time starts now. You're on mute council member. Thank you majority leader for your leadership and speaker Johnson also for supporting the resolution and, and related to borders reform. And one thing that I would like to invite all colleagues, all colleagues here is to please also think about it and only the solution that we pass, but we send in the message at the national level uh, when it comes to borders, right? But also think about what, what can we do and when can we pass the municipal voting rights that will make the city of New York the, the first large municipality that will allow New Yorkers that have working papers and, and green cards to vote in municipal election. If we talk about a, a border suppression, how can we leave suppressing the, vote, the rise of border that pay the taxes in New York City when the federal law already has said that the city and the state are the one that decide who votes to elect the population a big opportunity to leave by action. And I would like to encourage all my colleagues especially those that has, that has not signed the bill, since we have 33 council members that have signed it, the NWSCP, the Immigration Coalition, and, and Brooklyn Borough President, Borough President, is a, a controller cast stringer and others. So I need please to get the support of many of you to pass this bill. I also would like to invite all my colleagues to pay attention to the decision made by Rebel to suspend their services city and calling rebel to please take this time to improve anything that they have to do with safety. No doubt that rebel is for New York City, but also there's many so many issues related to safety that have to be addressed. Trabajemos todo para que pasemos la ciudad de Nueva York el derecho de que los inmigrantes puedan votar en las elecciones de la ciudad de Nueva York y de esa forma proteger el derecho de todos los inmigrantes. Thank you, Council Member Rodriguez. Council Member Adams. Time starts now. Thank you so much, Madam Majority Leader. Uh, I'd first like to say that I echo everything that Council Member Carnegie said regarding 
the gun violence across the city. It is up to us to recognize that the NYPD is not a panacea. We're looking for to stem gun violence. We have to look inside and we have to look at the available resources that we have inside. And there have been so many tributes given to Reverend C.T. Vivian and Congressman John Lewis. I don't think I can give enough, so I'm going to lend my two cents to the tribute. I do have been a daughter of Atlanta for a period of time and attended to Spelman College. And that's when I met Reverend C.T. Vivian. I was at school with his son who went to Morehouse College. And I was privileged enough to hear Reverend C.T. Vivian deliver one of the best sermons that I ever heard in my life. And I will never forget the subject of his sermon. And it was the other Joseph. I find it ironic that some years later, I went on to marry a Joseph. I was also blessed to meet the wonderful giant uh, Congressman John Lewis about four years ago. We visited several churches on a very cold morning here in Southeast Queens. And standing next to him, small in stature, but it was standing next to a giant. I forget it, the way that we went from church to church and he would tell the story of how he was a little boy and would preach to the chickens. We just want to continue to tribute this giant of a man, this icon, and we definitely want to call out any hypocrisy in Washington that we dare not pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act after celebrating his life and his legacy yesterday. Majority Leader. Thank you so much. Councilmember Adams, parliamentarian, are there any additional speakers who wish to speak at this time? Yes, Madam Majority Leader, Council Members Moya and Amprey Samuel. Council Member Moya. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader. Time starts now. And my colleagues, thank you so much. Uh, I'm here to talk about uh, my intro, intro uh, 2006. Uh, as we know, New York City's uh, homeless shelters uh, workers know what it's like uh, to be on the front lines of a crisis. Uh, that's what they signed up for. Uh, they're there to care for uh, New Yorkers. Uh, who find themselves in a personal state of emergency. Uh, with the COVID-19 crisis here, frontline security officers in our shelters continue to suit up and show up, despite the grave risks inherent in doing their jobs. As of April, there was 650 positive cases and 50 deaths among 17,000 single adults in shelters. Seven security officers who are 32 BJ members at city-run homeless shelters and at least one security officer at a privately run shelter have died from causes related to COVID-19. These workers are charged with protecting the most exposed and vulnerable New Yorkers. But for many security workers at privately operated city funded shelters, they earn just the minimum wage and often lack access to affordable and quality healthcare, meaningful paid time off, adequate training that no New Yorker, especially uh, those that are, not, uh, that, that are non-essential workers should have to work while being sick just because they can't afford healthcare or a day off. And that's why I'm introducing legislation today, intro 2006, that would require security guards working in private homeless shelters operated and contracted with the city of New York to earn the prevailing wage, the same wages earned by officers doing the same job in city run shelters. But this isn't just about safety, it's about justice. That means standing up for the respect and the dignity of all workers. I stand with these workers who are predominantly black and brown New Yorkers who are serving mostly black and brown New Yorkers. We cannot accept private contractors taking public dollars and then paying workers the wage, the poverty wages without meaningful uh, benefits. Uh, and I thank you, Madam Majority Leader and Mr. Speaker and my colleagues for allowing me the opportunity to speak today. Thank you so much, Council Member Moya. Council Member Alika Amprey Samuel. Time starts now. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader. Um, I also want to um, just add to the words of Council Member Robbie Cornegie, who talked about the um, killing of the precious one-year-old. I wanted to just um, also just, um, you know, just think about the mothers of the other one-year-olds that were killed. Um, we got to remember precious Layla Briggs, who was um, shot and killed. Um, in the triple murder suicide in March of 2018. And just thinking about her mother right now. Um, and then also thinking about Antique Hennis who was shot and killed, shot in the head on the corner of Bristol and Livonia um, 
in September of 2013 in the drive-by shooting, again, shot in the head, another one-year-old. And so, um, you know, as we just talk about gun violence, we have had so many one-year-olds who have been shot and killed in the city of New York, um, in Brooklyn, New York. And so I just wanted to think about those mothers um, and just um, keep those mothers um, in prayer because I'm sure as they watch the news, it just kicks up all kinds of um, feelings and emotions um, for them right now. Um, and so I just wanted to, to say the names again of uh, Layla Briggs and um, Antique Hennis. Um, um, but also um, today I'm introducing a bill um, as we talk about the right to vote in voter suppression. Um, we have to remember that last year, voters uh, decided to vote for ranked choice voting um, in the city of New York. And with so many issues and changes that we have and, um, and mistrust and all kinds of debacles that take place within the board of elections, uh, we have to remember that we gotta get it right. We gotta get ranked choice voting right for next year. And so this bill will um, require an education campaign for not just the board of elections, but also city agencies to make sure that the voters know that ranked choice voting exists, this is happening. Um, and there has to be some kind of campaign materials. Um. Um, that is put in place. And so I just wanted to put that out there. Clearly, we're all going to be talking about it. Um, but I wanted to mention that as we talk about voter suppression and voter rights. Thank you. Thank you, Parliamentarian. Are there any additional speakers? No, Madam Majority Leader. I just want to close out by recognizing, as many have today, my predecessor, the late, great James E. Davis. Uh, if there were no James E. Davis, there would be no me. Um, and there would be no Letitia James, Attorney General. His legacy is an important one. He gave his life to the fight to end gun violence. It was an honor and a privilege to know him, to learn from him. He came onto the political scene like a lightning bolt of energy with an infectious personality and magnetic charm that will never be forgotten. But what most will be remembered is his fight to take guns out of the hands of our communities and to love yourself and to stop the violence because we are so much greater than that. So I thank all of my colleagues. I will now turn the stated meeting to our speaker, Corey Johnson, to close. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader. Thank you to everyone for the moving remarks today. The stated meeting of July 28th, 2020 is hereby adjourned.